So I don't know what just happened, but YouTube kicked us off. So we're gonna try round two here. Um, that's a shame because we had like 80 or so people, but never mind. This is the uh, perils of doing live streams. We'll see what happens this time. What do you reckon? Hopefully you guys will stick around and uh, we'll see what happens. Hello, hello. <laughs> Gotta love technology. Yes, that's right. All right, we'll see what happens. All right, so the whole point of this live stream is to help you quit porn. The whole point of this channel is to encourage you to quit porn. So please subscribe, ring the bell, tell your friends about it. Just think it'd be funny. You could just email them. You could just say, hey, you, you look like you need this. That's that's my line. You look like you need that. Just, it's a great way to insult people. What I wanna do in this live stream is talk about seven celebrities who have spoken out against pornography. I wanna look at four ways to overcome lust that uh, 13th century uh, priest had to say, Thomas Aquinas. Don't worry, you don't have to be Catholic to, to, to agree that it's great advice. And then finally, I'm gonna look at psychologist Dr. Kevin Skinner's activation sequence. What is that? That's how to overcome. It, it, it's, it's the way by which we end up in pornography, right? The very thing that happens b between when you're tempted and then you look so that we can write a deactivation sequence. So that's gonna be about becoming really self-aware. And then we'll take some questions if YouTube hasn't kicked us off again. <laughs> All right, let's go through these really quick. Number one, James Hetfield, the lead singer of Metallica, narrated an anti-pornography documentary called Addicted to Porn, Chasing the Cardboard Butterfly. That's ridiculous. If you would have told me when I was 15 years old that James Hetfield would do that, I wouldn't have believed you or I would have thought you were high. It just seemed completely impossible. The reason we're beginning to see people publicly denouncing pornography is because the pile of research coming out of academia, different branches of science is piling higher and higher. Uh, number two, Terry Crews. Terry Crews in a Facebook video said, being on the internet allows you to keep it a secret before you had to go and search it out. Go look for it. Go to a strip club when somebody, where somebody could see you. But this is a secret. They don't have to see you at all. You can be all alone and it'll be just yours. This is such a good point. Um, we talk about the three A's. That's the first letter of the alphabet in case my accent is getting in the way. The three A's that the internet brought about. You know, before the internet existed, it was a lot more difficult to find porn. Now with the advent of the internet, pornography can be anonymous, affordable, and there's another A, anonymous, affordable, and something else. I don't know, but you get the point. It's very affordable or it's free. No one has to know about it. Um, you can do it in the privacy of your own home. So it's a lot more addictive. That is not one of the A's in case you were wondering. Cruz said, my issue was and is with pornography that it changes the way you think about people. People become objects, people become body parts, Notice I'm looking up continually to see if we're getting kicked off here. Accessible, is that the third one? I love that Anonymous is the one who said accessible in the live stream. Anonymous, affordable, accessible. <laughs> Boom. Thank you, Anonymous. Good man or woman. You're Anonymous, how would I know? All right, Russell Brand back in 2015 recorded a video opening up about his own pornography use and how he just really torched pornography. It was a pretty great video. I'm not gonna play it because there are some inappropriate things in it. But here's a quote from that video. He said, the cloud of pornographic information and even soft cultural smog is making it impossible for us to relate to our own sexuality, our own psychology. So you're constantly bombarded with great waves of filth. It's really difficult to remain connected to truth. Truer words have never been said. 
try to have an idea of what you want from loving relationships and what you want from sexuality because once that biological drive to procreate is connected to the culture of objectification, it's very it's a very hard equation to break. All right, so that's three celebrities we'll, we'll look at. And by the way, you might not care at all what celebrities have to say about overcoming pornography. Like, why, they're not your guide. They're not your priest. They're not your pastor. Why, why would you care? I think it's important because it shows that the discussion and the way the culture, if you want to call it that, views pornography is changing when these people are speaking up. Kanye West who legit had a pornographic image on one of his albums that he had blurred out, but it was clear that it was meant to be pornography, recently came out and said that pornography has messed him up, changed the way he viewed women. Listen to this. He says it affected every choice that he's ever made in his life. That's probably hyperbole, but interesting that he said it. Here's a quote from him. He said, like, for me, Playboy was a gateway into full-on pornography addiction. My dad had a Playboy left out at age five. Ah, oh, bless him. And it affected almost every choice I made for the rest of my life. From age five till now, having to kick the habit, and it just presents itself in the open like it's okay. And I stand up and say, no, it's not okay. Good for him. Billie Eilish is the next celebrity we'll look at. I didn't know who she was because I'm a cool dad. I actually believe that I'm cooler for not knowing anything about pop culture, just in case you think I was being sarcastic. I'm not, I'm just cool. Uh, Billie Eilish was on Howard Stern's show and she said this, as a woman, I think porn is a disgrace. And I used to watch a lot of porn, to be honest, she said. She said, I started watching porn when I was like 11. I didn't understand why it was a bad thing. I thought that's how you learn how to have sex. And she went on to reveal that her porn habit grew so bad that she was only interested in looking at material that was violent. And it warped her perception of sex, her own body, and led her to engage in behavior that made her feel worthless. Here's what she said. I didn't think, it was, I, didn't think I was attractive and I was a virgin. I'd never done anything and it led to problems. The first few times I, you know, had sex, I was not saying no to things that were not good. It's because I thought that that's what I was supposed to be attracted to. I'm so angry that porn is so loved. And I'm so angry at myself for thinking that it was all okay. Do you understand how cool that is that she spoke out? I mean, I'm obviously not advocating for this person. I'm sure she has done and continues to do a lot of things that are unhelpful or sinful or just wretched, but Beautiful that she said that. Orlando Bloom in March 2020, he did an interview with the UK Sunday's Times, said that he was taking a break from pornography. Here's what he said. Porn is super disruptive to your sex life, to your libido. Uh, he also discovered that it was impeding his ability to build relationships with real women. Yes, it will do that. They've done studies. They can't find any kids who don't watch it. Well, that's probably hyperbolic. Uh, my kids don't watch it, but then we refuse to let our kids have iPhones or use social media. That's a stupid idea. Stop doing that, Orlando Bloom, and your kids will be uh, much better for it. When you watch multiple people at multiple times in one evening, how is your actual real life partner going to match up? He said, it's just so destructive. Amen, Orlando Bloom. It's so true. I mean, if you're clicking from one fantasy to the next fantasy to the next fantasy, how is a real life flesh and blood partner going to match up? And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying because the real life flesh and blood partner isn't superior. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is it trains you to view sex the way somebody who only ever eats at Golden Corral views food. Like that they're not there for the quality of the, the eating experience, right? They're there for, forgive me if you're a Golden Corral fan, but like subpar food, but they just want a ton of it and they want variety. If you treat yourself like that, like if you've only ever eaten McDonald's, and then you sit down and try to enjoy a beautiful meal, like a nice steak, a glass of wine, you won't be able to enjoy it. And it won't be the steak's fault. It will be your fault because you've conditioned yourself to that. All right, the final celebrity we wanna look at is Pamela Anderson. So Pamela Anderson was obviously in Baywatch back in the 90s. She was a playboy uh, bunny. Isn't it awful how we say the word bunny, by the way? Penthouse used to call them pets. We have to dehumanize that which we seek to lust over. 
Someone once said you can't lust over people, you have to first reduce them into an object to use. So that's, uh, that's interesting, I think. Simply put, so this is an essay that she collaborated on with an academic. So I'm not sure how much of this she wrote, but this certainly sums up her thought. She's done interviews on it subsequently and has expressed as much. Listen to this. Simply put, we must educate ourselves and our children to understand that porn is for losers. A boring, wasteful, and dead-end outlet for people too lazy to reap the ample rewards of healthy sexuality. I think she's right. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying people who look at pornography are losers. I think you have to always distinguish between the person and the act. I mean, pornography is a awful, uh, spineless, cowardly, pathetic waste of time. More than a waste of time, it's destructive. But if you're here today, it's because you're presumably wanting to break free from pornography. And so this doesn't include you. Like if you're somebody who falls to pornography frequently, even every day, and you're genuinely trying to break free of it, and you're not just giving lip service to trying to break free of it, but you're actually doing things, then good for you. That's huge. That's, that's huge. And we're going to talk more about that today. All right, so there are seven people who've demonized pornography, and rightly so. Let's take a look in the live chat, see what some of y'all are saying. Uh, Leem Flanginator says, Sad, children with internet access is a form of neglect without serious monitoring. I fully agree with that. Your kids need your love to protect them from evil while they are growing up. Absolutely. And look, this is not a condemnation on you. Being a parent is hard. Being a parent in the 21st century, you can feel like a guinea pig. All this stuff is being pushed on you, pushed on your kids, pushed on their peers. And it's difficult. But... I'll stand by what I'm saying here. I do think giving your children an iPhone or a smartphone or allowing them um, unrestricted access to the internet is absolutely a form of neglect. Uh, Stop it. Cut it out. But my kids will hate me. Who cares? Like, love them enough to make them hate you if that's what it takes. Like, love them enough to have them say all sorts of nasty things about you. Don't be a coward and, and give in to them because, um, yeah, like this person said, it's a form of neglect. Dan Carmen says, Matt, can you discuss how you work through some of the psychological side effects of not masturbating? I find that this is often not discussed in Catholic circles, but so challenging. I don't think there are psychological side effects to not masturbating. I think masturbating is an unhealthy, uh, abuse, self-abusive act that we should not engage in. I've got a video coming out soon here on the channel all about that. In my book, The Porn Myth, which is a non-religious response to pro-porn arguments, you can get it on Audible, you can get it on Amazon. Um, I have a whole chapter on pornography, and sorry, a whole chapter on masturbation. People often try to say that masturbation has healthy side effects. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's misunderstood. It's what cowardly men say to justify cowardly behavior, it seems to me. Or women. What else have we got here? So feel free to be a bit more specific and I'll get to it. Um, are you talking about when you're already addicted or in general? We'll, we'll get to that. Thanks to you and Covenant Eyes, I've been free since January. Keep it up. That's awesome. Guys, if you don't yet have Covenant Eyes, you should have Covenant Eyes. I have Covenant Eyes. I have it on my laptop, my phone, my desktop. I choose an accountability partner, also known as an ally. And Covenant Eyes takes screenshots of what you're viewing and sends those screenshots to your ally, especially those ones that seem to be problematic. I tell you what, how does that change how you you use the internet, right? Like maybe you're here today, you're like, I just can't stop looking at pornography. Okay, well, just pause for a moment. What if I told you that every time, you could look at pornography, that's fine, go for it. But every time you do, someone will be standing over your shoulder and watching the thing that you're looking at. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. Probably you wouldn't do it, right? Well, that's essentially what Covenant Eyes does. So I would highly recommend people go check out Covenant Eyes. uh, Let's see. If someone doesn't struggle with pornography but does struggle with masturbation every few months, would this preclude them from entering a relationship? I would say not necessarily. C.S. Lewis has a great quote about masturbation. And again, I have a whole video on this coming up where he talks about that... This harem of imaginary brides, 
we might call them mental prostitutes, okay, that we invoke when we masturbate, essentially become the means through which we increasingly adore ourselves. Because when you masturbate and you fantasize, the fantasy is never calling you to become less arrogant. It's, it's she, she or he is not calling you to become less vain, right? And you can endow them with psychological and erotic, uh, you know, um, aspects that no real person can rival. And so if you train yourself in masturbation and then try to enter into a real relationship, can you see how it won't work? I mean, there's other arguments against masturbation, namely it, it, it perverts the function of the sexual act. So even if you never got into a sexual relationship, it will still, I think it's still detrimental. I would say that masturbation is to the sexual appetite what bulimia is to our appetite for food. It's just, it's, it's not good, it's not natural, and pointing to the animal kingdom to try to justify it. <laughs> you know, like monkeys masturbate, yeah, okay, but they also eat their own poo. So maybe we shouldn't be looking to the irrational members of the animal kingdom in order to justify our own cowardly behavior, you know. Let's see what else we got. All right, I want to move on. And I want to take a look at four ways to overcome lust. Now, let me just preface this by saying that often what we're looking for is an out of the box, crazy uh, idea that you've never thought of that will be quick and simple. That's why you see so many videos like this crazy trick will help you regrow hair or this quick, crazy idea will help you lose belly fat. We all want something we've never heard before that's simple and requires nothing of us. You know, G.K. Chesterton once said that Christianity hasn't been tried and found wanting. It's been found hard or difficult and left untried. So these four things that Thomas Aquinas suggests are four things you've already heard. But it doesn't mean they don't work. <laughs> what it means is that we just have to do a better job of putting them into practice. Sound good? As I sip from my water. Here's the first thing that Aquinas says. Now, keep in mind, Aquinas lives in the 13th century. And so we're going to have to adapt these for the internet age. But let's, 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 let's look through them. Actually, I wonder if I can show you what they look like. Ooh. Let's see, but there we go. That's pretty good, isn't it? That look good? Let's go through these. First way we can overcome lust is by fleeing external occasions, such as, for instance, bad company. And in fact, whatever may be an occasion for sin. What's wonderful about Thomas Aquinas is almost every time he makes a point, he backs it up with scripture. He says, do not gaze, and he's quoting here, obviously, Sirach, do not, I think it's Sirach, do not gaze upon a maiden, lest her beauty be a stumbling block for you. Do not look around you in the ways of the city, nor wander up and down in its streets. Turn away your face from a woman dressed up, meaning a prostitute. Do not gaze upon another's beauty, for many have perished by the beauty of a woman, whereby lust is enkindled as a fire. All right. We could obviously apply this if you're a young woman today and you look at pornography and or if you're looking at homosexual pornography, like man, woman, okay, we're not, just, we're not saying that only men struggle with pornography, so um, put that to one side. Okay, this is really good. So we need to flee the near occasions of sin. It's not enough to say, I will not sin. We have to flee those near occasions of sin. So if I watch Netflix and I know there's some sexual scenes in it, I'm putting myself in the near occasion of sin. Now, depending on your tolerance for it, you know, like maybe my wife can watch a movie with me that has a brief sexual something or other and it not affect her, but it would affect me. So there needs to be some self-knowledge here, right? So I need to distance myself from that Netflix show or whatever that show is. I need to distance myself from bad company. If I'm surrounding myself with people who are encouraging me to do bad things or are using foul language or are speaking in sexual ways or glorifying fornication or stripping or porn, I need to flee from that like I would from a snake. We have to have the courage to make really good changes in our life. 
Like right now, what are the changes you're gonna make in your life right now? It's gonna be, it's gonna be tough. Like for example, uh, I have a phone and I have blocked the app store. I have the Covenant Eyes app, but nothing else can access the internet. That's, that's kind of a cool thing that you could do. If you find that you can't even be trusted with a smartphone, then think about bad company. See how he says bad company? As your phone, like your phone is your constant companion. Is it bad company? Get rid of it. Break it with a hammer. Drive over it. Like strong decisions need to be made if we're serious about overcoming pornography. And then he quotes Proverbs 627. Can a man hide fire in his bosom and his garments not burn? <laughs> Taking it, that's a rhetorical question from Proverbs because uh, no, the answer is that is not possible. And thus Lot was commanded to flee. Neither stay you in all the country about. So here's a line for you. Uh, don't be such a coward as to remain. Flee. All right. It's not an act of cowardice to remove yourself from a lion that's trying to eat you. It's prudent and sensible. And if you didn't, you would be an idiot. All right, so fleeing from external occasions. Let me know below what are some ways that you have found helpful in fleeing from um, external occasions of sin. Now, you'll notice this next way is really helpful because Whereas in the first way he's talking about external occasions, here he's talking about internal occasions, right? Namely our thoughts. He says the second way is by not giving an opening to thoughts, which of themselves are the occasion of lustful desires. And this must be done by mortif mortification of the flesh. I chastise my body, I bring it into subjection. So one, a great way to remain stuck in porn is to dissociate and to numb out. Have you ever been in a death scroll on Facebook or YouTube? Have you ever heard of a death scroll? It's where you're just kind of scrolling, 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 scrolling. Your brain is essentially turning off. You're not in tune with the movements of your heart or your interior life or your thoughts and it makes you much more susceptible to uh, looking at pornography. By the way, let's just go back up a step here to the first. I like what he said here. He says, uh, do not look around you in the ways of the city, nor wander up and down the streets. That language really refers to a sort of effeminacy, I think, in men in particular. And by the way, when Aquinas uses the term effeminacy, he, he means a softness that we justify, that we give into, and in so doing, abandon our responsibilities and our duties. So when I say effeminacy, I'm not talking about, you know, whatever, stereotypical masculine traits or like uh, shallow masculine traits or anything like that. I I'm talking about a sort of softness, right? And this seems to indicate that, like looking around, like not having a firm purpose, right? Wandering up and down the streets. And we can apply that to technology. Don't be looking around. Don't be clicking around. Don't be wandering up and down the streets of Instagram, as it were. All right, but back to this, the second way, not giving an opening to thoughts. One thing I found really helpful, and we're gonna address this later on in the live stream, is to recognize when we're being triggered. Like when a thought enters our mind, to be aware of what that thought is leading to and to combat it with another thought, you know? So if a thought comes to me like, you know what, I'm just, I'm just gonna look at pornography one more time, it won't hurt. You know, I could say in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke this lie. This has never made me happy before. It won't make me happy now. It'll just further entrench me and enslave me in a sin I don't wanna be enslaved in. I rebuke it. So being aware of our thoughts and not giving an opening to them. Like you could think of the devil as like a really smart war strategist who prowls about, there you go, there's an allusion of 1 Peter 5, 8, who prowls about our castle, as it were, looking for an entry point. He's not gonna storm the part that he knows is strongest and where he's likely to be repelled. He's going to look for those gaps and weak spots. So to always be aware and not to give the devil an opening. I just was reminded of Snow White. 
not the Disneyfied version, but the Fantastic Brother Grimm's version, right? Where the witch comes to her disguised as something else, disguised as somebody who wishes to do her good. And because Snow White is not on guard, she's taken out. Likewise, we have to be on guard against these thoughts, even when these thoughts dress themselves up, as it were, because we know that what they're offering us is a poison apple, yeah? All right, here's the third way. He says that we can overcome lust, perseverance in prayer. Perseverance in prayer. Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. And also, he said, we read in Wisdom, I knew that I could not otherwise be continent except God gave it. And again, from Matthew, this kind of, this kind of sin, this kind is not cast out, say, by prayer and fasting. All this is not unlike to a fight between two persons, one of whom you desire to win, the other to lose. You must sustain the one and withdraw all support from the other. So also between the spirit and the flesh, there is a continual combat. Now, if you wish the spirit to win, you must assist it by prayer. And likewise, you must resist the flesh by such means as fasting. For by fasting, the flesh is weakened. All right, so this kind of reminds me of that meme online right now. Like, within you are two wolves, you know. All right, we won't get into all the humorous aspects and developments of that meme. But that point is you have two wolves within you. One is bad, one is good. And the question is, well, which one wins? The one that you feed. All right. And so I like this a lot. So before the wolf analogy, maybe, uh, we have Thomas Aquinas saying, it's like there's two people fighting, right? And haven't you felt that? You know, like there is a part of you that wants to live a noble life that wants to be about good things, that doesn't want to be dragged into the murk and underbelly of the world. But then there's a part of you that is in pain and just wants to satisfy yourself immediately. I know what that's like. I mean, anybody who's ever tried to stick to a diet uh, or a lifestyle, if you don't like the word diet, has, has experienced this. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, like, <laughs> what's that shirt that says... I want a six pack, but I also want tacos. <laughs> Whatever you want more, you know, is, is gonna win. And so sustaining that part of you that you want to win, right? Not lying, not, not feeding that part of you that's gonna make you unhappy. So is it gonna be difficult to abstain from this new Netflix or Amazon show that everybody's been telling you to watch? Yeah, it will. But in the long run, you'll be happy, happier, because that Netflix show may feed that part of you that's going to make you unhappy. So abstaining from external occasions of sin, exter abstaining from internal occasions of sin, but then also doing something productive, right? Praying and fasting. Now, here's how I like to think of fasting, right? If I can't say no to that next cup of coffee or that next alcoholic drink or that next Oreo cookie, if I cannot say no to those things, how will I say no to not looking at pornography? Because here's the thing, all things being equal, um, pornography is actually much more pleasurable. Masturbation, sexual delight is more pleasurable. Again, you know, unless you're starving to death, but then that Oreo cookie, right? than that alcoholic drink, than that next cup of coffee. So if we can begin to deny ourselves these small things that will strengthen our will to then deny these greater things that are more difficult to overcome. Now, there's different thoughts on this, but I'm of the opinion that if you're someone who would say, look, I'm addicted to porn, or you might say, not use the word addicted, but you, know, you might just say, I'm hooked on porn. I think it'd be helpful to give up those things that often precede you looking at pornography, right? So as good as it is to, to fast from food, to fast from alcohol, to fast from warm showers, right? All of that has its place and can be fantastic. But maybe fast from YouTube. So for example, I, I said earlier, I use Covenant Eyes. So I've used Covenant Eyes to block Twitter because you there's like a blacklist you can put in, right? I don't want to be on Twitter. I don't want to look at it. 
not for sexual reasons, just because I think it's a cesspool of awful humanness. So maybe you disagree, but if you do, you're wrong. So um, I don't, I can't access Twitter. I can't. So like here, let me, let me show you. Let me show you right now. If I go here and click Twitter, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And I like that, you know? So choosing to do things like that, I think that's, that's a really good idea. All right, let's go to the fourth way. Keeping yourself busy with wholesome occupations, right? So we're talking about praying, we're talking about fasting. These things are very important. Let's say one more thing about prayer. Prayer is not the coin I use to put into the vending machine, aka God, to get the thing I want. We want to refrain from a transactional relationship with being itself, from the omnipotent, omnibenevolent, omnipresent God who sent his son to die for you and wants a relationship with you. But sometimes we do treat God like that. Like, well, I said my prayers, therefore I shouldn't, why am I being tempted? This doesn't make any sense. No, I think what we want is intimacy with the Father who loves us. Like God isn't scandalized by your sins. He's not shocked by them. It's not like it took him unawares. Like, whoa, we didn't see that coming. The day that God saved you, brought you into a saving relationship with himself, he, it's, he's aware of your future, just like he's aware of your past. You and I are only vaguely aware of our past. We are completely unaware for the most part, I suppose, of our future. But God is, God sees your future like he sees your past. He's not, sh so when he saved you, he knew that you would fall today or yesterday or tomorrow or five weeks from now. He loves you deeply. And so I think this confidence in the love of the Father is what we want to cultivate in prayer. This intimacy with the one who loves us. We want him to be our refuge, right? As the Psalms repeatedly say, not porn. We want God to be our refuge. So when I'm in pain, when I'm frustrated, when I'm angry, when life is chaotic, I want him to be my refuge, my fortress, not porn. All right, fourth way is to keep oneself busy with wholesome occupations. From Sirach, idleness hath taught much evil. Again, this was the iniquity of Sodom, your sister, pride, fullness of bread and abundance and the idleness of her. St. Jerome says, be always busy in doing something good so that the devil may find you ever occupied. What's funny to me is sometimes we hear um, these like cliches and we forget that, that some of them originate either in scripture or the church fathers and so should be treated seriously, right? Be always busy in doing something good so that the devil may find you ever occupied. Now, says Aquinas, studying the scriptures is the best of all occupations. There you go. There's Thomas Aquinas. Studying scripture is the best of all occupations. As St. Jerome tells us, love to study the scriptures and you will not find, and you will not love the vices of the flesh. Now you say that and it sounds easy, right? You think it can't be that easy. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it's just that you and I don't love the scriptures as we ought to. And by love, I don't mean some feeling, some warm and fuzzy feeling about the scriptures that you need to cultivate or else you're not properly loving them. How about just preferring them? What if I preferred scripture to the Daily Wire? What if I, what if I read more scripture than text messages daily? What if I really began to seriously cultivate a daily habit of meditating on the Holy Scriptures. And again, I think sometimes we have this exaggerated lofty view of prayer or the Scriptures, you know, like we have to feel a certain way for it to be working. It's like, no, 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 we just have to put ourselves before it. There's this great group called Exodus 90, uh, who I promote on my other podcast, Pints with Aquinas. And Exodus 90 has like a 21 day challenge and a 90 day challenge and it's pretty cool because you join forces with a few other brothers and for 90 days fast from things you don't want to fast from, like warm showers, and take up things that maybe you're not used to taking up, like hour, an hour of prayer a day or something like that. In fact, as I'm talking, I think I'm going to bloody do it. I think I'm going to do Exodus 21. Exodus 90 was way too long for me, but Exodus 21. Check it out, exodus90.com. 
They're not telling me to promote this. I just really believe in the work that they're doing. But that's a way to kind of be accountable to daily scripture reading, to keeping yourself busy in wholesome occupations because it's so much easier. It's so much bloody easier to watch Jordan Peterson or something or Joe Rogan or cat videos or who cares anyway on YouTube than to be really intentional with our life, you know? And one of the ways we can be intentional is by bringing other people along with us, finding someone, even if they don't live in the same city as us, bring them, bringing them along for the ride with us as it were. Check it out, please. Please check it out. All right, so there are some ways that uh, there's four ways, which I think are like really, really good. I'd love you to tell me below in the comments section what you think about that and what are some helpful ways that you've found to, to overcome lust. All right, what I wanna do before looking at this activation sequence by Dr. Kevin Skinner is take a look at some of your questions. So if you're in the live chat, feel free to throw up a question or a comment or something like that. Mario Barati says, stop looking at women who dress in a provocative way. Easier said than done, but thank you. Women who are dressed modestly give you a chance to see them as human beings. Amen. That is the great privilege of those men and women who choose to dress modestly. If someone doesn't dress modestly, I'm more likely to see the body as something separable from the person. If somebody dressed modestly, and by the way, modestly doesn't mean ugly or frumpy or like wearing some big potato sack or something. It means like with class, with the respect that you as a human being deserve, then I, okay, then I can be introduced to the person. As Jason Everett once said, if, if I'm first attracted to the body, I may just wanna to get to know that, you know, separate from the person. Pretty much filling in all the nooks and crannies of avenues to porn is the only thing that works for me, says Anonymous. Let me know what you mean by that. Vanessa says, I dissociate due to past sexual trauma. It's awful. I'm so sorry. If you are not yet seeing uh, a therapist, do that. Find a certified sex addiction therapist in your area. There are websites where you can punch in your postal code. Look one up. This sounds like something that you're going to need more help with than just what I'm going to be sharing today, obviously. Andy says, sorry if this has been asked before, but will this stream be available when it stops? Yes, it will. Uh, uh, uh. If you've ever searched for anything that tempts you to sin, then delete your search history and delete any bookmarks to sites that tempt you. That's right, Lex Vivendi, thank you. Jose says, in my experience too, it's very related to the my acedia vice. Right, yeah. What is acedia? Sometimes called sloth. Sloth is that vice which makes me sorrow at the good that's required of me. That's one way to think of it. And so we end up sort of floundering and just becoming bored. Our eyes wander, we wander, we become directionless. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 uh. Jared Martin says, it sucks when you're around people who don't understand your struggle. Like my siblings like to use Snapchat to communicate and I can't use it because I start scrolling through all the thoughts. I've never used a uh, Snapchat, but you know, like I think there's ways to tell your family, I don't want to use this application without saying, I don't want to use this application because I look at porn. You know, they're not necessarily um, have any right to know about your personal struggles unless you choose to reveal it to them, of course, especially not your siblings. So even just saying like, yeah, I don't want to use Snapchat because it's just a waste of time for me and I don't like it. I think that's enough, you know? Jose says, oh yeah, I remember my Catholic friend who led me back. She was modest and beautiful inside and out. Nice. Oh, Vanessa's in therapy. EMDR is great, that's beautiful. Stephen Burnett says, I work from home, but I just have to leave the house sometimes. That works. Absolutely. Therese of Lisieux, um, 19th century French nun, talked about retreat as the last course of action, not just in sexual things, but maybe you're about to lose your temper with your kids, or your husband or your wife or whatever. And you know, if you are going to lose it, if you look at pornography in your instance, then getting out and leaving is, is, a, is, a, is a manly thing to do. Can you give us a tour of your shelves? Uh, sure I can, but I'm not gonna do it right now, but I will recommend this book. 
I wrote this book a few years back. It's a non-religious response to pro-porn arguments. I don't make any money from this book. If you buy this book, I don't make a cent. 100% of the royalties go to help sex traffic victims in San Diego. The only reason I tell you that is one, I want you to think I'm a good person, but two, I don't. it's not why I'm pushing this book on you. It's not for financial incentive. It's just a very good book, very well researched. I go into a lot of different things in this book. You can get it on Audible if you wanna hear some English bloke read it to you, or you can, whatever. You can, or you can not get it, but it's an option for you. Um, Mario says, I fell last year in lust with dating without the right mindset. Sounds tough, but Catholic courtship needs strict rules. No French kissing, for instance. Why do the French always get the cool things, you know? French fries, I know that wasn't even their idea, but still, French kissing, why does it be French? What's German kissing like? I don't wanna know. Um, no, it's absolutely the case. Like, where is too far in dating, you know? Like how far is too far? It's a good question. I've heard some people respond kind of cleverly to this and they'll say, well, the question you should ask is how far can I go in loving this person? And that's a good point, but you're still left with, yeah, 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 great. But what can I do? And for me, I think anything that I do that prepares my body or her body for the sexual act is too far. If I'm French kissing a girl, this is clearly preparing our bodies for sex, just biologically. So it's a bad idea if the two of you have decided not to have sex. You know, if I'm lying down with her, laying on my chest, like maybe it's not preparing her body for sex, but bloody well is mine. And so there's a good place to draw the line as well. What do you think? <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh yeah, there's a spin browser app I use. It's got filters and blocks, might be a help. St. Therese of Lisieux, pray for us, yes. This is a bit specific, says JP, the stream punk artist, probably not his real name. But training martial arts helps me by providing consistency and introduces me to many people and gives me a realistic view of women. Sweet dude, it's awesome. All right, what I wanna do now um, is look at Dr. Kevin Skinner's activation sequence. All right, so here's the deal. Whenever you look at pornography, at least two things have happened. One, you got the idea to look at pornography, or you woke up in the middle of a dream, or something like something uh, triggered you, as it were, and then you looked at pornography, right? There's two things that happen. Um, but there are five things that happen in between those two bookends, as it were. And by examining these five things and seeing how they apply to us, by examining this activation sequence, we can write a deactivation sequence. All right, so I wanna put this up now and show you what it looks like. So whenever we look at pornography, there is a stimulus or trigger, then an emotional response, then a first thought, a chemical release, body language, the battle, and the behavior. I wanna go through these right now. So first, the stimulus or trigger. First thing to say is, and what do we mean by that, right? Obviously, I'm not talking about that thing on a gun. I think I'm talking about that thing that, that uh, causes something else. And so what are some sexual triggers? Well. You know, maybe an unexpected sex scene in a movie you were watching. Maybe it wasn't unexpected. Maybe you were looking at it for that reason. I don't know. Maybe a sexual advertisement, you know. Maybe one of those sort of scandalous and trashy clickbait thumbnails at the bottom of whatever news site you happen to, to look at, right? These things we can think of as triggers. There's also non-sexual triggers, by the way. I've had people reach out to me and say, I always get triggered when I'm in hotel rooms. So there's something about the anonymity, I guess, of a hotel room that triggers this person. Or maybe you just get a new device and you don't yet have covenant eyes on it. And that's a trigger. Again, that's a non-sexual trigger, okay. But in order to be triggered, I think we have to first be in a emotionally compromised state, okay. So if I'm firm in my security of being a beloved son of God, you know, if I'm acting out of love towards my wife and children, if I'm well, you know, if I'm sleeping well and I'm not abusing my body with alcohol or too much food, you know, I'm in a good place, then often triggers may have little or no effect on me. So that's the first thing to realize, right? We have to be living a beautiful life, you know? Um, but let's look at these. First, stimulus or trigger. What are your triggers? You don't have to put them in the live chat. You can if you want, just don't be explicit or anything or in the comment section below, but don't be, don't be explicit. 
we don't we want to be respectful of those who are here you know who might be really struggling right now but the reason i ask you the question what are your triggers is these are very specific to different people i once met a well actually i spoke to a psychologist dr marianne Layden. And she told me the story of a woman who came to see her, was it, no, a man who came to see her. And for him, down jackets were a trigger. You think, what the bloody hell does a down jacket have to do with sex? Well, through their work in therapy, he came to find that, well, they came to discover that he was sexually abused as a child and there was a down jacket in the room present. So some of these things are really difficult to untangle. And the help of a good therapist is, is required here. But what are your triggers? Again, your triggers might be doom scrolling Facebook. It might be having the phone by your bed at night. Like really, if you were serious about recovery, one thing you could do is write this list of seven things down, one thing on each page of paper, and then write down all of your triggers. What are they? All right. The next two things happen together. There's an emotional response and it's coupled with the first thought. What are your emotional responses? Like when you're triggered, how does that make you feel? That's a really important question to spend time thinking about. Maybe I feel anxiety, a fluttering in my belly. Maybe I feel curious. Okay, well then that's coupled with a first thought. What is your thoughts exactly? Not what are other people's thoughts. What are your thoughts? And it might be things like this. I could look at pornography right now and no one would know. Or it could be, I'm not going to look at the really bad stuff. I'm just curious about this thing. It's almost like you shut part of your thinking brain down and then you just allow yourself to be lied to. What are your thoughts? One more time won't hurt. Or I'm going to go and confess this tomorrow, so I'll just do it one more time and get one in for free, as it were. Obviously, it's a false thing to think, but these are the things we can think. So what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? Anonymous says, and this is a beautiful thing, beautiful because you're honest, I mean, being rejected. Being rejected. Yeah. I mean, what is sex it's the coming together of a man and a woman who give of themselves and who accept the other fully and bodily so if i'm rejected it stands to reason that i'm going to want to be accepted in that most intimate of ways now of course pornography is a counterfeit of that and it always leaves us disappointed and hurt wounded but you can see how that trigger leads to that choice can't you what are your thoughts what kind of things do you say to yourself to justify the behavior again you don't have to put them here but think about it it's really important L luigi says my trigger is feeling discouraged when encountering relationship issues discouraged in relationship issues so i don't know the details of that situation, but like just, we could just think about that. Okay, so I'm discouraged in relationship issues. Okay, suppose those, by relationship, you presumably you mean like sexual relationship, maybe with a spouse, right? Yeah, all right, well, suppose I'm frustrated and discouraged by my relationship with my sexual partner. Well, then pornography seems like a nice alternative, right? Because no one in pornography has ever been hesitant to give themselves to you. And again, it's a counterfeit, it's fake, it's a lie, it hurts you. But again, we can see why we go, right? Stephen Burnett says, my emotional trigger is fear of failure. If I'm afraid I'm going to fail, what does that say about me? That's the question to ask, right? What does that say about me? Well, it means I'm no good. It means I'm not who people think that I am. I'm a loser. Well, what does pornography say? Well, pornography says there's all these amazingly beautiful people who want to give themselves to you fully who don't think you're a loser. I mean, just it's really not that difficult to see how our triggers, and by the way, these are beautiful and, and honest and humble triggers. So thank you for, you know, that, that, that's, really, that's really helpful. All right. Um, 
the next two things that happen, we'll throw them up on the screen here, are the chemical release and body language. So once you entertain a thought to act out sexually, your body begins to prepare for sexual climax. And so there are chemicals dumped into the system as it were, and then your body responds as proof of that fact. So our body begins to prepare, obviously differently in men and women, for the sexual embrace. The fact that your body is changing, even if it's not, you know, non-sexual things, uh, or at least non, you know, not necessarily explicitly sexual changes, like a sweating of the palms, or a fluttering of the heart, or a something happening in the stomach, right? Something is going on, and this is because of the chemical release. Now, Dr. Skinner says, once you've hit the chemical release part, you'll probably end up falling which might sound super discouraging, but in another way, it just shows why we gotta be so vigilant in this number three part, the first thought. If you think of this activation sequence as a highway, all right, and if the, the destination is the sexual behavior, then you can think about examining this highway in order to make a U-turn on this highway. In other words, once I'm triggered, I gotta turn around. I gotta to say to myself out loud, this is a trigger, I don't wanna go down this road. You know? Well, once I start dealing with those thoughts, those thoughts that say one more time won't hurt, like it's okay, I'll just do it quickly and then I'll just, I'll say sorry and we're gonna combat that. Like Thomas Aquinas says, not allowing those thoughts to kind of get in. Because once the chemical release happens, you're, you're bound for destination porn land, or at least that's what Skinner would say, right? Finally, you have the battle. The battle, right before the behavior, he also calls as the second thought. At this point, it's almost like your brain's backup system to not just slide into a behavior unreflexively um, or reflexively. So you've got a, a competition of thoughts going on at this point. Thoughts for the behavior, thoughts against the behavior. Here, I need to ask you to be super honest with yourself and say, what are those thoughts? What are the thoughts that you have? And those thoughts could be, look, I'm gonna give in to this bloody thing anyway. I may as well just give into it now and just get over it and try again tomorrow. What are those thoughts that you have? You know? They can be super specific. They can be super subtle. What are the thoughts? You then have thoughts against the behavior. That's why it's called the battle. So you have thoughts like, I don't want to do this. This has not made me happy before. I don't want to disappoint my husband or my wife. And I, I don't want to have to confess this. I don't want to be the kind of person that masturbates to his phone. That's so freaking lame. What are the thoughts that you have? Because here's the deal. Whatever thought wins, the behavior will ensue. Whatever thought wins out, the behavior will ensue. So if the thought that I just, I can't do this wins, then the behavior might be giving your phone and computer away and going on a walk and going on a prayer and meeting up with a friend and having a good chat, okay? But if the thought of one more time won't hurt and I give in to that, I consent to that, then the behavior will be pornography. I found this really, really helpful for people as they've sought to free themselves from pornography. Let's say a word about freedom. And then if you've got questions, put them in the live chat. I wanna to get to as many as I can before we wrap up today. When I talk about victory from pornography, what am I talking about? When I talk about freedom from pornography, what am I talking about? I think it's more helpful to think of victory as a daily choice, you know? Like a sometimes hourly choice that I make. For Christians, final victory is heaven. Yeah? Purity is, sexual purity is one of those virtues that's going to help us become more fully alive and get to heaven. Um, but I don't think we should think of victory as a sort of physiological experience that happens here on earth once I've done number one, number two, number three, and bought Matt Frad's book on Amazon. It's not like you then wake up the next day and go, oh my gosh, that's what victory is. Wow! It's not like that. And I think it's unhelpful to paint it in that way. I think victory, freedom is daily choices. What kind of man do I want to be today? What kind of woman do I want to be today? And it should be way more specific than not look at porn or the kind of person who doesn't look at porn. It should be like, I want to expose myself to good books and good music and 
good friendships. I want to invest in people who I love, you know. This is how we begin to find victory from this stuff. And I would say that a setback doesn't have to mean failure. A setback doesn't have to mean failure. If I'm climbing a mountain, and I've been climbing for a few hours, say, and I stumble and I fall back a couple of feet, I'm not at the beginning of the mountain again, am I? Likewise, if I'm finding victory from pornography, it's been a week or it's been two or it's been a month, and then I have a setback, all right, I had a setback. Get bloody up and keep moving forward. Um, setbacks don't have to mean failure, right? Victory is one day at a time. So we'll leave it at that. And let's take a look at what some of you have to say in the live chat and then we'll wrap up. By the way, if you haven't yet, subscribe and ring that bell button so that this channel can uh, help a lot of folks. Gravelord says, to be honest, there are times I've failed where God did not even cross my mind until after the act. Yeah, uncharacteristic and terrible to even remember it. I know the feeling, man. It's like lust is like this fog that intoxicates us. And that's kind of back to the activation sequence with this chemical release body language, which is precisely why we have to be vigilant about not putting ourselves in the near occasion of sin. And we have to be vigilant about the thoughts that we entertain. Uh, Anonymous says victory with, oh, why are there so few of us here? Well, I mean, this, this isn't few, 72 of you are here, that's pretty cool. This is a smaller channel than Pints with Aquinas. Pints with Aquinas that I run has over a quarter of a million. This has 13,000. So I, if there were three of you here, I'd be pleased. But if you want more people to get in, then like it, share it. Like I'm relying on you guys to do it. I don't have a big marketing team that pushes victory. I need you to do that, at least not yet, but it would be cool to get to that point if I did have a marketing team and you to do that. Stephen Burnett says, I'm married and I have no idea how addicted single people commit themselves to an unknown amount of time without sexual release. Kudos, singles. All right, so here's the... I think there's a problem with this way of thinking. If I say, how is it that single people cannot have sex? I'm sort of implicitly acknowledging that my wife is a sexual outlet for me. And I have this false perhaps Freudian view of sexuality, that it's this bubbling tumultuous thing that needs an escape or else something harmful will happen to me. People think they need to ejaculate or have a climax the way they think they have to urinate, like that their body will break down. This is just a freaking lie. It's not the case. So I think we wanna be careful about that way of thinking. You know, yes, of course, like like having sexual desires and being with a wife or a husband is a sexual release and it's, it's in its proper natural context and therefore it can be healthy and beautiful and wonderful and bonding. That's true. But if the, you know, if the only reason I'm not masturbating right now is because, hey, I got a wife ugh, or hey, I got a husband. You see how that's, see how that, we don't want to start thinking like that. You know, maybe we do think like that, but like that's not the optimal way I think we should be thinking. Um, I'm not trying to shame you there or anything. And obviously this is a short comment. You may have had a lot more to say, so I'm not trying to, um, I don't know, pretend I understand everything you were saying, but just that basic thought I think is a problem. Emily Wilson, what's up? She says, do you have any tips for opening up to people about this addiction? Loneliness is a huge trigger for me. And I know that it can be more open with people, but it can be so scary. So I think it's really important that if you're a lady that you find a fellow female to confide in. And if you're a bloke that you find a fellow fella, bloke, whatever, guy to confide in. I don't think it's helpful for men to have women as accountability partners or women to have men as accountability partners. So if you're a lady, which you are, I would say finding a girl that you trust and sharing this with them. Now you might say to me, well, how do I know who I can trust with this? And I would say the seemingly, but not necessarily very unhelpful thing, namely, you already know who you can trust. Like who are the people in your life that you share your life with, that you share intimate things with? Go to them and tell them this. Because I've had women come back to me and say, I told my friend and you'll never guess what happened. And I always can guess, but uh, she said to me, wow, you too, I thought I was the only one, you know? 
So porn thrives in secrecy. So listen, this is something worth remembering. Some things can only be healed by the antiseptic light of truth. Uh, pornography is one of those things, you know, being honest, being truthful with another about our struggles. So do that. Do it. I'd highly recommend it, man. What's the, what's the alternative? Because no recovering porn addict. I've never met anybody who's like, yeah, I did it totally alone. I never told anybody about it. Never met anybody. And all the therapists I speak to say the same thing. So. Cheers. Ivan says, my trigger, being overwhelmed by the intense work that surrounds me in my studies and in life itself, then lying to myself and falling into thoughts. You have helped me a lot by the grace of God. Uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about this in another episode, but I think being aware of living a well-balanced life so that we're not emotionally fragile or compromised like I said earlier, triggers usually only have an impact on us when we're not in a good place, or at least they're more likely to have an impact on us when we're not in a good place. So it's not enough to say, what's the bad stuff I want to stop doing? We got to say, what's the good stuff I want to do? Camillo B says, is getting rid of the desire the goal or not doing any action the goal? So the only thing that can conquer a desire is a stronger one. I think that's a fact. I just said it out loud and I'm thinking about whether it's true, but I think it's I think that's right. If my desire to go home right now is greater than doing this live stream, then I'll stop it and I'll go home. If my desire to lay in bed in the morning is greater than my desire to go at work, go to work, then I'll, I'll just lose my job or something, you know? So what could be greater than a man or a woman's desire to lust? I think that's obvious. We want to love well. We want to live beautiful lives. We want to fight for the dignity of others. I think these things do run deeper than our desire to selfishly use people. So we want to kind of tap into that desire and encourage it. And realize that that desire perhaps runs even deeper than our desire to use or objectify. So it's not about getting rid of the desire. I think it's about transforming it or allowing God to transform it. You know? You can't make yourself not want something. But you could ask yourself, what is it that I want? And you might realize that what it is you want is actually something beautiful. Here's the thing. Whenever we sin or engage in any activity that's harmful to us, we do it because we perceive it to be a good. Thomas Aquinas would say that no one does evil for the sake of evil. We do it for the sake of some perceived good. Even the person who commits suicide does it with the intention to end suffering. And ending suffering is a good. It doesn't mean that suicide is good, obviously. I'm saying it's a perceived but not actual good. So... When you say getting rid of your desires, which is you know fair enough, but I'd say, well, what is it you really desire? Don't just be like, look at porn. But here, okay, what is it you're after? You might say all sorts of things. You might say, well, I want to relax, or I want to feel excitement, or I want, I want to stop feeling sad, or I don't want to be bored, or I, I want to feel wanted. Okay, these are all good things. Maybe, you know. Then you'd say, does porn actually deliver on any of these promises? And the answer is it bloody well doesn't. You know, so maybe changing how we think about what pornography gives us can help. Jeremy says, what have you experienced as the best approach from or as an ally after Covenant Eyes has notified you of a possible slip? Yeah, contact the person immediately so they know that you've got their back. Accountability is not about calling each other out. It's about calling each other up to be the people we want to be, right? So doing that is with love is really great. With tenderness, with gentleness, not with frustration is really helpful. That would be the first thing I would say. And then the second thing would be like, hey, could we chat about this? And then and, and just kind of what happened and how can we avoid that in the future? And, you know, you don't want to beat yourself up and you don't want to give yourself a pass. And that's the same with the person that you want to be an accountability partner to. 
What's the best way to confess this in confession, says Vanessa. It's so hard. Just by ripping the band-aid off, you don't have to get into details. Just say, I've looked at pornography three times and I masturbated three times, and then go on. I think saying the thing you don't want to say the most up front, rather than kind of burying it in the middle or saying it at the end, is the best way to go about it. Recognizing that the priest is a sinner like you're a sinner. He's not there to judge you. That's not why he became a priest. That's not why he's sitting in the confessional. He's there to dispense the mercy of God. Um, Anonymous says, is it okay to bring up pornography in ordinary conversation in an effort to call its evil existence into light? Possibly, it dep I mean, Jose Maria Escriva says, don't even talk about evil things, not even to condemn them, you know? But I think there's a way in which one might be able to do that, you know, as long as not one's not being graphic um, in any sense of the word, but just sort of saying, you know, this, this, Maybe what, maybe what you could do, maybe a good compromise, is rather than just calling out pornography, extol the beauty and masculine and manliness or the womanliness of, the, of purity. David says, I got a question. Are you less culpable for your sin of masturbation if you are extremely, <laughs> extremely hormonal teenager? I would say that if you want to ruin your life, keep justifying your masturbation. If you want to ruin your future marriage, keep justifying your your masturbation. I know that's not what you're asking. And I know you're not here to justify your masturbation. But sometimes lurking beneath the question, a question like this, is this desire to really have your sin justified or explained away. I would say masturbation is an example of self-abuse and it should never be tolerated and we should repent of it and we should strive with all of our might to be free of it. Saying extremely hormonal teenager, okay, how about you be an extremely virtuous man who does what he's got to do to be better. I mean, you're going to marry someone one day, presumably. And if you do, the, the man she'll marry is the man you're making right now, the man you're forming through your choices. So I'd be less concerned about your culpability uh, and more concerned about the manly things you're currently implementing to see to it that you're growing into a virtuous man. Conovan says, I've been trying to approach friends to have an accountability partner, but my friends embrace porn openly. You know the type. How should I go about this? Probably new friends and quit porn. Yeah, I'd say so. One of the cool things about victory is you could find someone in the comments section. Like, why can't we just make friends here? Why can't you find another man here who wants to live a good life and say, can I get in touch with you? Do you have a website I can click to? Could you, do you have like, can I contact you over Instagram or something? We could do that here. How about this? How about this? In the comments section below, say if you would be willing to be an accountability partner for somebody. Okay? Do that. And then maybe you guys can get connected. My friends, I'm going to go, but I love you very much. I pray that you have a beautiful, victorious day. If you haven't yet, subscribe, ring the bell button, and um, let us know in the comments section what you think about these live streams and if you'd like me to do them more. God bless.